How's it guys? I'm MJ the Student Actuary and Mario and I made a video earlier and we had a lot of fun with it so we're thinking of making another one and also we get to film a little bit more of Emerson. <laughs> okay so now that we've got the corgi out of the way Mario um let's he talk wants to add to the discussion as well what he? what does he want to add to the discussion i don't know how does he he wants to tell us why he's from buckingham palace <laughs> hey old buckingham palace yeah. what do you think of the whole british economy at the moment to me <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't have a clue on the british economy i said ask a question that's irrelevant <laughs> yes no i guess i caused you to ask that question so <laughs> All right. Okay, so something more, let's get back into actuarial science. And one thing I've been seeing in my notes and, you know, in CA1 and especially in the finance specialist subject are these things known as exchange traded funds. Correct. It's not really, it's not purely actuarial because, I mean, well, I mean, I, I don't know what you can classify as actuarial today because, I mean, actuarial science, you know, has branched out from the track classical insurance sense to marry it into, sorry, not marry, but into a whole lot of fields ranging from healthcare, um, short term insurance, life insurance, pension funds, um, finance, um, especially fi um, sort of asset management, but within the side of the insurer, but also um, a very common focus on liabilities. And most recently, um, and also new area actually is going into is, is banking. So maybe that's why. You know, exchange traded funds might become of use to actuaries, but also they are probably useful um, in, to, in an asset liability management strategy. So, I mean, exchange traded funds, do you well, want to ask something? Yeah, before, before we go into the whole exchange traded funds, are you allowed to talk a little bit about the new banking um, ST subject that's been launched? I know you did a little bit of behind the scenes work on it. Oh, the, the, it's not the banking ST, it's the banking specialist application subject. I yes. It's F206 that it's going to be called. Oh, is it a fellowship exam? Yeah, it's a fellowship exam. Oh. So it's an SA. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it's launched by the, so the, the Actuarial Society of South Africa. And what that basically aims to do, it aims to sort of um, probably provide actuaries with a solid grounding in the capital requirements of banks. So instead of going and delving into the solvency framework, they will uh, delve into the Basel framework and the, the more specifically the Basel III framework. Now, for those who don't understand what Basel is, Basel is the committee that is, it's a banking regulation committee. So they set rules and regulation for banks. And so they set these rules that the bank must follow. And, 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 and a big chunk of these rules pertain to the capital that the bank must in fact hold so that they fall into this category that they don't, they don't fail, that they could continue to operate as a going concern. I recently learned a new term that, that over my studies this week from last year. I didn't realize that there was something called a gone concern versus a going concern. And a going concern means the company can operate into for the foreseeable future and be able to um, repay its debt as, as it goes along. But a gone concern means it's gone, fine, dusted, by it's defaulted, can no longer operate. Um, so to get back into the Basel, so Basel, as you said, is a committee that sets these regulations. So it's basically reg um, rules and regulations on the capital that banks must hold. Now, um, what is important to note about the Basel um, requirements is that um, they're not necessarily fully enforced by banks. The Basel committee sets these directives or guidelines and then the local regulator within the country will use these as a basis to set their own regulation for the bank. So South African regulation, as far as I understand, is much, much more stringent than the actual Basel regulation. That's why they say that our banks are of a very good credit quality and a very good capital position compared to overseas banks. And that's precisely what this new banking subject, in fact, aims to introduce to actuaries. Okay, so it also it opens, if you're looking at doing the subject, it opens an avenue into, um, into a new area or a new field, you know, in, in particular banking. So it's nice for sort of, you know, people who are doing actual science but may want to go the banking route. And then also, it also deals a lot with the risk management of financial instruments that these banks um, issue. So it doesn't delve into the mathematics of these instruments, but it makes basically delves into the more qualitative features. So for example, 
you as a bank have so many loans on your book. How do you hedge those loans with other assets so that you know you're not in a completely sort of in a complete position whereby you've lent out all your money and you've got no other money to pay the checking deposits and the short term um, um, requirements of the banks? Because an interesting thing is remember that banks are what they call structurally mismatched in that they have a very a lot of their money is lent out in terms of liabilities in the long term and they only get that back, but they've got these very short term sort of um, instruments or features that they have to pay, such as your and my. Um, accounts or, or checking deposits or savings accounts that we have on a daily basis. So, yeah, so then that's basically what the subject aims to be to bring actuaries to. Okay, I see you asking more questions now. So, so well, something I was reading in The Economist magazine is... You um, Economist? Yeah, Great. well, they, they have it at the office, so, uh, you know, I read I it. I get it to my post and I'll never read it. Oh, no, I, I read it during my, yeah. my good old no, coffee break. Article, it's interesting. And, um... So, one of the, the big top stories at the moment has been the Chinese stock market and how it's declined. And what it said is one of the measures that the Chinese government's doing to try boost their economy or boost the stock market is they're lowering the capital requirements on the Chinese banks. So they're saying that the Chinese banks have to hold less reserves and they're doing this to try and encourage lending that will stimulate the economy. What, in your opinion, are some of the risks of doing that? And do you oh, think that's a good idea? Well, this is a typical CA1 or, I don't know what, A101 or A201. A, I think it's A302 in South Africa. Oh, A301. So A302 yeah. is communications or something, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a typical kind of question. I mean, one of the glaring risks is obviously that, I mean, should they issue sort of um, a lot of unsecured lending and they don't get the money back? you know, they could very easily default in their obligations. And the last thing you want in the economy is the banks defaulting because people have a lot of trust in the banks. That's where they ultimately store their money at the end of the day. So, I mean, that is definitely a major risk is that you're encouraging more default. So, are you saying that China's possibly taking a gamble on their economy? To try and solve a short-term problem, they're risking their long-term stability. Precisely. I think you put it very well in that... Um, that's exactly what they do. They're taking a gamble that they are suspecting that, you know, by encouraging more lending, there's going to be a growth in the economy and that business and company that take up these loans will be able to repay the banks at a later stage. So that's the assumption that they've made, which is a very risky assumption, you know, because, I mean, their success is dependent upon a, a, a number of factors. You know, and China must also remember that it's not the only growing country within the world. You know, you've also got the other BRICS members such as Brazil, um, India, you know, and that they're in competition with those countries. Well, just talking about BRICS, I read about another article about countries that what they call the mint countries. So that's Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria and Turkey. And like you said, there are also other cu countries that are growing um, rapidly. And yeah, maybe China's losing its position as being the fastest growing economy and that they're reaching their heights. So the question... Well, they could be. You know, this is what I don't understand is why there's this focus, focus on economic growth, economic growth, economic growth, and increases in the output of the economy all the time. Why isn't there just the focus on bringing the growth up to some optimal level and then maintaining it at that level, you know, and maintaining the output, you know, instead of just saying, oh, we want to increase it, increase it, increase it, increase it all the time, you know. Well, I think even a better measure would be... Um, growth per capita. So not just, you know, an absolute growth, but how are you growing compared to the amount of people, you know, in your country? Because if China, let's say, you know, imports a whole bunch of workers or, I don't know, does something and they increase the work base, then the economy will grow. But then it's not growing relatively. And that's something that I think maybe economists need to, need to reconsider. But let's maybe... Um, now that we've chatted about the whole banking and, and China, um, I thought we were, yeah, originally we were going to chat this video about um, electronic, what were we going to chat? Exchange traded ex funds. Ex oh yeah, I knew I was saying with an E. Exchange traded funds. So what what basically is an exchange traded well, fund? Well, I mean to tell you, you know, you and your computing background, there was in fact a quite interesting exchange traded fund that's recently been issued. That's, um, it's one that's based on cyber insurance companies. Oh, I, I like cyber insurance. So it's companies, you know, it's, I mean, cyber insurance, you know what that is. Yes. So, I mean, what, that, that's just protecting companies against um, fraud and hacking and that from the computer side of things, all sort of. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, no, yeah. What's I mean, the correct word. It's not a sort hacking. Of, um, breaking down of the system by a, a hacking person or someone who hacks into their system. And there's apparently big growth in that market. So there's been an exchange traded fund that has recently listed in the USA and is traded that has um, its constituent stocks, okay, are cyber protection companies. Okay. Yes. And they're predicting that it's going to do quite well. But I've been watching the performance and it's been highly erratic. Although it has, it only started launched, I think, at the beginning of this year. And it has gained significant value over time. Now, I'm not using significant as in the statistical concept that we mean at 5% significance or something. No. It has grown by quite a bit. But it's a very erratic performance. But a lot of people um, suspect that it's going to do very well. So, with that sort of little bit of a pointless preamble at the beginning, um, well, so th well, that's the whole thing. So an exchange traded fund, instead of me as an individual trying to pick which cyber security company is or which cyber insurance company is going to do the best, I rather come to this exchange traded fund, I put my money with them and they'll have a manager whose day job is to select a group of the cyber insurance companies which he feels will do the best. And if one starts doing badly, he can do the selling and he manages all that type of stuff for me. Correct, and then the very nice thing about exchange traded funds is that you get access to the group of these 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 um, these underlying stocks, okay? But the, the 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 fees that are charged are very very low and make them much 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 lower, in fact, than the fees that are charged on the um, on the on, on unit trusts, for example. What, why mean? is that? Why the, why the, the... I'm not a hundred percent sure why it is so different. I think it's just because they're not managed that frequently. Okay. The, the, their constituent stocks aren't changed that frequently, but I, I, I'm not 100% sure on that issue, but you'd have to check me up on that. Um, but also what is pretty cool about exchange traded funds is that they're, tra they're traded on the market, hence exchange traded funds. Mm -hmm. But unit trusts, however, are traded usually over the counter. So there's also less market frictions, you know, the minute it comes into on trade on the market. And also what is nice and neat about exchange traded funds is that the value of the of your unit's holdings in there is not only affected by the value of the underlying units as it is traditionally in the case of unit trusts. It's also affected by the market value of that exchange traded fund. So the market value of the exchange traded fund might be vastly different to the underlying units. Okay. Yeah. So now so that's a nice thing about the exchange traded funds. Now exchange traded funds, let's say I come up with an idea and I want to create my own exchange traded fund on a basket of shares. Mm -hmm. How do I, as an individual, go about doing that? So who were these guys that made the cyber insurance exchange traded fund? They were a specific asset manager from the US as far as I can remember. And what regulation or what I hoops? I'm not sure what regulation one we need to follow. I'm really not sure on that. Um, it would probably be similar to the unit trusts or the unit linked funds, but I'm not really sure. But the basic setup, I think, would be the same as unit link fund in that you just then, you create your fund and you decide what units you want to hold, you decide on the management fees or whatever, and then you you take your um, your units, you, 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 you pull it together, you slice it up into little pieces that investors can buy, and then you list those pieces on the market, and then the market, the people from the market then buy those pieces, and they essentially determine the price of those pieces. Then. But now, if I take a little fee from this, I could potentially make money regardless of whether my fund goes up or down. Well, that's always what happens in unit trust. I mean, that's that, that's that standard. If the fund goes up or down, remember that there's a fee has certain components. The performance fee is generally related to the performance of the unit trust. And will an exchange trader fund have performance fees? I'm not 100% sure. Because let's say... But there's th always an admin fee. An admin fee will always apply. Irrespective of what the return is, there will always be a two, three, a certain percentage that will be an admin fee on the value of your unit. Because this is my idea, okay? Can I make an exchange-traded fund on gaming stock? So oh, yeah, on, You could make an exchange-traded fund on whatever stock you wish, as long so, as you just think that you have the suitable investor base that's interested in buying into that fund. Well, yeah. So, for example, King, they made Candy Crush. Yes, yes, I buy yes. a little bit into them. I buy a little bit into... What are some of the big gaming companies? Uh, Nintendo, yeah, Sony. Buy into Nintendo, buy into Sony's gaming division. Yeah. Um, you know, Naughty Dog, they're the guys who make Drake Uncharted. You know, make... Oh, so, also all the ones who do the computer gaming software. Yes. Or, EA games. Who do EA games. games. And then, so what I do is I make... Because video gaming is a growing industry. It's something that people, you know, 
it's like a hobby. People go into it and they spend a lot of time and a lot of money on it. And if I just, because I don't know, is there an exchange trader fund for video game companies here in South Africa? I don't think so because um, are there video com video game based companies within South Africa? But I mean, they could not necessarily contain so, ones from overseas. I'm not sure. I think that there, there must be. I mean, there's a whole there there there's a huge variety of these funds on offer. I mean, if you just look at the list of what's what's traded, I mean, it's massive. So there, there would you say that there already exists a video game? Like an, an I, don't I haven't seen anything because I would have seen it if it was sort of a bizarre thing. But look, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it does exist. Because so we could make our own ones. So we buy a bunch of, say, Korean, yeah, Japanese, you need, and American you need, you need companies. Like an asset management and asset managers license. You know, you can't just go out there. And, and how do we get that? Backing. You need to buy it. From who? From I think what's our regulator called? The, the FSB. The FSB. I think. I think. I think. I'm not. I'm not hundred percent sure. We have to just check that, but I know you've got you've got to get a, an operating license, you know, and you've got to have capital to back it. So, I mean, because if you suddenly default or you take all that money and you suddenly just run off and have a no, no, wait, wait, the Maldives, that would be um, you can't do that. Why do I need capital? Because I'm buying a basket of shares, and what I'm basically selling is the basket, and I only buy that basket of shares when people invest in me. I think you need capital just because of the requirements that you've got to hold as an asset manager. I think you need a certain amount. Of capital held in safe assets and in a certain amount in your other and and how much you know, cause you can't, I don't think you I don't think you can fully default I'm not sure I'm not an asset manager so I wouldn't be the right person to ask on this and in something like say subject f206 or you know the new banking mm -hmm. fellowship exam is this something that would be covered in that course not specifically as um, I don't think there's that much covered on asset management, so I don't I don't think so. Would that be more in the finance fellowship? I think that's definitely more in the, the, the finance and investments um, courses. So the F two O five or the SA SA five or SA six exam papers. Because if you had to write your fellowship now, mm -hmm. would you choose to do it on the banking fellowship or the finance fellowship? Um, I'm, well, look, the banking fellowship is only offered in South Africa, and I'm qualifying for the UK board, so I'll probably have to do the finance and investment fellowship, I think. Okay. Yeah. And, oh, uh, yes. I so see that's your... I just answer my phone, please. Okay, yeah, yeah. let's end the, the interview there. Yeah, yeah. that was cool. Thanks. Go, Go on to your phone. Now. Cheers, Mara.